um, I want to particularly I want to uh, particularly point out, I see Sally Bradshaw, always good to see an independent bookstore uh, owner um, from Tallahassee, uh, Florida. Sally, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to get to meet my friend Ed Wilson uh, this weekend. Looking forward to that. Uh, Ed, coming out to, to, uh, uh, to Montana. Um, terrific to see Carl and Candy, as always. Um, we, are, we have the fishes from Sacramento. Um, so we've got California, Michigan, Boston, and big thanks to um, Alyssa, who is making it an international event tonight, joining us from Calgary, Canada. So uh, again, I'm Doug Mitchell, joined tonight uh, by the amazing Glacier Conservancy team, um, Stacy Dubuque, Sean O'Leary, and Grace Kinsler. Um, thank you guys for your help. Uh, we are uh, uh, really honored tonight. I'd like to welcome um, a very special guest tonight, the author of Land on Fire, Gary Ferguson. You've likely read Gary's work before, perhaps in Vanity Fair, perhaps in the Los Angeles Times, or in one of his 26 books that he's celebrated in, that he's published in a celebrated 30-year career as a science writer. Um, a couple of titles that you might want to investigate if you haven't done already um, from our sister park uh, in Montana down in Yellowstone are uh, Walking Down the Wild and Yellowstone Wolves the First Year. Um, Gary's kind of um, adventure stories of, you know, 500 miles hiking in the park in one case and, and spending some time with the first, I think it was 14 uh, wolves released uh, in, in Yellowstone National Park here in Montana. So um, Gary is joining us from his home in um, Bozeman, uh, Montana, known as Boz Angeles to some. Uh, Gary, thank you for being with us tonight. It's really a pleasure, and uh, what a thrill to see so many faces. It's, uh, it's, it's great. On a cold, cold day in Bozeman, you've, you've warmed it up a little, so thanks for being here. Uh, for those of you who think I'm crazy uh, wearing a coat, um, uh, I will tell you that your donor dollars go very far in the Glacier Conservancy because today we chose to not have heat uh, in the office, so uh, this is in fact a necessity. Um, the gloves have gone by the wayside, but um, so uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. Um, this is going to be a really interesting and important night to talk about the changing face of wildfire. But before we start, I wanted to kind of investigate a little bit about, you know, uh, Gary, you grew up in Indiana. You went to Indiana University during the heyday of uh, Coach Bobby Knight in the 1970s, not to age guys like you and me. Um, but how, do, how does a guy from the Midwest um, make his way to the West and to the idea of writing about the West? Well, it's odd, and, and some parts of it I don't really understand myself. But when I was nine years old, uh, by chance, I uh, was in a Walgreens pharmacy with my parents, and they would often say, well, you can go buy a comic book if you wanted. And instead of buying a comic book, I, I went and purchased a, a magazine called Colorado Rocky Mountain West, and it was just filled with these beautiful photos of, of the Rockies. I had been reading about them even at that young age. And I announced to my parents then that I was uh, going to move to the Rockies. And when I was 13, I showed up in the living room one, uh, I think it was a night in May, and I laid out the money I had made in the previous year from uh, shoveling snow and, and mowing lawns and, and had maps all across the floor and decidedly patiently, so they get on board with me, pointed out how I was going to ride my uh, purple Sears Stingray bike uh, that summer from uh, South Bend, Indiana to uh, Colorado to Colorado Springs, uh, about, I don't know, 1,100 or 1,200 miles. I had it all figured out how many miles a day. I said I'd be back and plenty of time for school. And weirdly, they they said no. And I, uh, I, I was crushed about that. But as soon as I was able, uh, while, I was, while I was in college, I got a job as a uh, interpretive naturalist in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. And there, at that point, there was uh, absolutely no going back, no going back. Wow, that's a that's a great story. Um, you know, young young ambition. So your your many miles journeys uh, started at a young age. That's a that's a great story. Uh, so as we kind of get started and reoriented, I know for a lot of us it may have been a few months since we read the book. Um, we announced this, uh, you know, last year, and and so kind of give us a little bit of a primer, Gary, if you would, about kind of the topic in general and where we are in this new reality of wildfires in the West. 
Well, I might tack on another part of my personal story is when I started working as a naturalist in the sawtooth, I had as a boss, uh, uh, he was about 62 years old at the time, uh, an ex-Navy chief who could not have loved nature anymore named Chuck Ebersole. And he would take me out onto the landscape and almost like Socrates, try to steer me into trying to figure out why things looked the way they did. And one of the subsets of that particular set of lessons was uh, was fire. And I did come to see the Western landscape as having been shaped, of course, over thousands and thousands of years by fire, as far as how the trees were spaced, uh, the adaptations of trees like uh, ponderosa pine to not to, to drop their lower branches as they got bigger so fires wouldn't have ladders to climb up, the thick bark, um, you know, the, the kinds of plants that would grow in certain areas. Uh, fire was from my early 20s, in my mind, a, a really big factor on the landscape and a super super healthy factor on the landscape. I mean, in the, in the inner mountain west especially, where we don't have this kind of decomposition uh, organisms that you would in the Northwest or much of the East, the, the biomass really gets regenerated and recycled and the nutrients put back into the system by virtue primarily of fire. So without that uh, fire, things start to get very, very messy. And that's the first point of, of land on fire is that beginning Around 1920, a little before then, there was a decision made that, that we need to stop all fires uh, as fast as we possibly can. The Forest Service really wanted to align itself as the agency who was associated with, with putting out fires. And, and, and especially after the big burn of 1910, uh, there was a lot of outrage that public resources were being lost to this kind of enemy, as it was often described, fire. And they did a, a, a very good job. They got a lot of funding uh, from Congress. They set up a, a 10 a.m. rule where if you see a, a, a fire start, you, it has to be out by 10 the next morning, which of course is often impossible to do. It is now and it was then. But nonetheless, there, there was a mentality that took hold uh, about we need to put out every fire. And so these low intensity, moderate burns that would come every 5, 10, 15 years through much of the West. Uh, and they would generate flame heights, maybe five, six feet high and have temperatures in the flames of about 1400 degrees. Those were part of returning that biomass to the, to the system and keeping things healthy and limiting insect and other pathogen outbreaks. Well, when we put the hammer down on all fires, including those modest, moderate uh, low intensity burns, we started getting uh, a lot of fuel buildup in the, uh, on the forest floor. And one of the two reasons we're in such a, a rough place right now is because we had about 70 plus years of suppressing fire, letting those fuel loads build up until uh, right now we've got about 300 million acres that are uh, overly loaded with, with fuel, unnatural levels of fuel had we not done that for, for 70 years. Um, that's about three times the size of California. So it's a lot. It's a lot of, of, of land. And when you put that then up against the other enormous factor, which is climate change, you've got a huge fuel load and it's drier than it has been uh, in the past. Uh, our droughts are, are more intense. And snowpacks are going off about three weeks earlier than they than they were 50 or 60 years ago. All of these things are coming together in sort of a perfect storm to uh, to make fire still necessary for health of the forest, but at the same time, awfully risky to uh, to the human communities uh, and some of the natural communities as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's super, um, you know, that's super interesting. And we think, you know, there's a lot of other great reading about that. I, I think particularly about Robin Wall Kimmerer right now and, oh, and braiding yeah. sweetgrass, right? A very, yes. a very special and accessible book about um, indigenous people in a different way. And you, you speak to that, maybe you could expand on that a little bit, the, the different way that um, the, the indigenous people and Montana's first people, glaciers people, um, you know, thought about this, this issue of, of fire. Well, yeah, it's, it's a great point. And it's interesting in the um, infrastructure bill that funded 
uh, $3 billion for fire prevention treatments that we'll get into later, uh, included opening up uh, an active place and dialogue and direction for indigenous leadership for how to pull this off as far as treat, treatment of forests and, and uh, keeping fire as a, as a healthy force in the, in the landscape. Yeah, for thousands and thousands of years, indigenous people uh, understood that after fires, certain kinds of favorable grasses down in California, it could have been uh, fruit trees. Uh, I mean, there were, there were all sorts of things that were imbalanced by virtue of the fires that they long ago saw naturally come to the landscape, learn from what those natural fires were doing uh, in the landscape, and then manage their own landscapes, including in the uh, all, all across this continent um, and other places in the world, to uh, keep that landscape healthy. And so humans have been managing uh, in that sense for thousands and thousands of years, their landscape. And, and there, there were a few voices back in 1910, 1920, when we were deciding we were gonna declare war on fire. There were a few indigenous voices and some others who were listening to them who said, you know, I don't know if we should really do that. In, in remote areas, maybe we should let the fires burn. And that was just uh, quickly nixed. Uh, as, as just not okay. Uh, fire was going to be an enemy and we were going to uh, attack it with, with everything we had. And now we're reaching back as we are for a great many things from how to live with caribou uh, to fisheries uh, strategies from indigenous wisdom and, and native scientists who are, are, are helping us move back toward a more holistic way of being. Yeah, the, the um, interconnectedness, right, of of things, I, I saw you talk a little bit about um, this idea that now, perhaps more than ever, we need to start thinking about protecting the other things on, on our planet. Um, we talked earlier when we were visiting about Doug Chadwick in his new book, Four Fifths of Grizzly. Basically, mm. we're, we're all four fifths of grizzly when you strip off the DNA, mm. um, that there's a lot of similarity. And you've been speaking. Um, publicly about that and about the need for us to think more about protecting those those other other species, if you will. Um, and and uh, tell us a little bit about that work. Well, uh, about three or four years ago, my wife, uh, Dr. Mary M. Clare, who's a social scientist, and I got together, so to speak, and took my background as a conservation science writer hers as a social scientist and started looking at, are there ways to really take the wisdom that is routinely suggested in the way life works in nature, the qualities nature has that allow it to not just survive, but to thrive, uh, the superpowers nature have, and, and try to figure out how to better be in touch and express them. And this was her social scientist uh, end of things. Uh, in our own lives, because we are nature too, uh, as, as Doug is, is sort of intimating. And so it would make sense that we would have an opportunity in our own way, we're a unique species, but still to express the things that are true about what makes life work on the planet in general, to embrace those as, as human beings. And interconnectedness is one of the paradigm perspective shifts that we, we really, um, I, ho I hope we can incorporate more. I, I, we've, we've come up over the last 500 years with sort of a subject object way of thinking. Some of that was thanks to good work in science with the scientific method and led to all kinds of good things. But we've gotten really uh, attached to this uh, separation myth where I, I'm just one isolated individual in this in this universe of isolated individuals. And when you, you know, when you go outside, uh, wherever you are, if, if you're walking under trees or near trees, city park, wilderness, wherever you happen to be, it's not just a matter of you giving off carbon dioxide, the tree taking that in, the tree giving off oxygen, you taking that in. Trees are also giving off chemical compounds called phytoncides, which with every breath uh, that you take are strengthening your vital organs, uh, fortifying your immune system, your, your ability to sleep, and produce melatonin, which not only helps you sleep or prevents cancer, is, is set by the amount of daylight you get. There are more microbes living in your body than there are human cells, most of which were not with you when you came into this world. They're breaking down the nutrients that make it 
possible for you to think and walk. They're on your skin and they keep uh, dangerous pathogens from getting in. So there's a porosity of life and an interdependence that's so way beyond. And this circles back, Greg, to what you were saying about indigenous uh, practices and indigenous philosophy. They knew from having looked so closely and lived so harmoniously with the natural world that that was the way things were. Uh, that that interconnectedness is just simply a fact of biology. It's not a it's not necessarily a, a woo woo philosophical perspective. It's a fact of biology, and so I think that um, there's some hope to the degree we can move back in that direction. Yeah, I think you guys talk about it as repairing our relationship with the natural world. Right. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, I was really interested in that, and I think that we're going to share a link if it's okay to the oh, full please. ecology. Thank you. Um, website. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you guys are have a Montana retreat in the Centennial Valley, maybe in June. Yeah, we do. It's going to be a, a magnificent uh, four days in the Centennial Valley at the J Bar L Ranch, right looking right into the Red Rock Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. And we're going to explore some of what I've, I've just been talking about as far as uh, the notion of uh, reclaiming our human nature and repairing our relationship with the natural world. It's it's going to be great. So if you're interested in something like that, yeah, co- go to fullecology.com and check it out. We'd love to have you. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Again, Doug Mitchell with the Glacier Conservancy here with Gary Ferguson, author of Land on Fire and many other things. Um, for our assembled group, um, feel free, as always, to uh, use the chat feature to ask questions. And Sean's going to moderate um, some Q&A uh, for us tonight. We have plenty of time uh, for that. And also, if you just want to raise your hand um, by using the rea- in the reactions tab, weird place for it, um, there is a raise hand feature um, Zoom finally figured that out after um, they were beaten to it by uh, by Microsoft. But um, and then you can just raise your hand. We'll identify you and unmute you, and you can ask your question. Um, Gary, I was curious also um, um, as I did my research for tonight. Uh, you you reminded me that the while we while we have a lot of concerns about where we are today, looking forward, that sometimes we forget where we came from. Uh, I worked for Senator Baucus and worked on the Clean Air and Clean Water Act um, uh, measures with him. Thank um, you. And and you you re- you remind us about the you tell a great story about the wilderness bill. So I'm not going to tell it for you, um, but of growing up, it's back to Indiana and growing up in Indiana, and you know being eight years old and kind of walk us through that because I thought that was a really interesting way to think about what appears today to be hopeless. Um, but when we look back at where we came from, um, might actually be something we can collectively do something about. Well, and, and if I'm telling the wrong story, Greg, uh, redirect me. But uh, what what I recall from uh, being young, uh, and, and a lot of it I found out about as I got older in Indiana, but when I was eight, my brother and I would swim in uh, boat channels, uh, not too far from our home, that in hindsight, we we understood uh, we're just absolutely loaded with DDT and uh, and other uh, chemicals that were meant to keep the weeds down from them. Uh, we had particulate smog from the steel mills of uh, Gary and uh, East Chicago, which were about 45 miles to the west of South Bend, uh, creating uh, all kinds of uh, issues for a lot of people who were compromised as far as having asthma or uh, you know heart disease even. There were kids who, uh, especially in the inner city of even South Bend, but certainly Chicago, who were uh, exhibiting all kinds of uh, problems related to lead poisoning uh, from loss of uh, IQ and mental faculty to other problems with vital organs. So, you know, that was what was really going on uh, as as this um, backdrop against my childhood. And by 1972, of course, uh, we start to get uh, a a lot of positive outcomes from people like you working awfully hard to uh, create a Clean Air Act and a Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act, uh, uh, on and on and on. So that, that collective outrage of what we were doing to ourselves and what we were doing to the land to no small extent did lead to some very good things, including in 1964, when I was eight years old, the uh, passage of the Wilderness Act, which really was, as far as I know, the first time 
nature and just nature was giving was given rights to exist and to express its full capacity outside of the conveniences and the marketability and the, and the benefits to humans. And that was a, a landmark piece of legislation. I should say one quick thing about that, though. When I was going around talking about the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act a few years ago, uh, some of the indigenous people who are I, I hung out with, uh, some friends, were we're, we're often just really taken aback that the whole notion of, of preserving wilderness over here it just didn't really make sense, or it certainly didn't seem like an ideal system to them. Because to them, there was, again, back to this porosity, back to this interdependence, there wasn't wilderness over here, and, and we're, we're somewhere else. There was this planet and the, and the life on it. And so I, you know, I think given where we were philosophically and developmentally, it makes perfect sense. And I'm very glad we created every ounce of wil acre of wilderness. And I hope we create more. But I, I get their point. It, it did sort of for them bring up the very different way of seeing our place in the world than, than a lot of people on this planet have. Well, and you, you know, the whenever you say a thing is one thing, then if it's not that thing, it's something else. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and so that's also problematic. But, you know, also to think back about the fact that the wilderness bill did not pass because somebody had to beat a cloture motion or um, get the vice president to vote. If my memory serves, maybe there was one vote in the entire United States Congress. That's right. One vote, one vote against it. I, I mean, think about that for a minute, folks. <laughs> um, you know, uh, no matter what what side you're on, um, you know, the, the fact that we could have something like this pass with one no vote in the United States Congress is really, really something to think about a seminal, uh, a seminal time that did, as you point out, build on, on some things. So as we then fast forward to today, right, we're, we are in a different place with some new challenges. Um, you know, think through with, with us a little bit, um, Gary, about um, you know, so we, we think of climate change, right? And probably think of climate change the same way the Mullinses who are from Cincinnati, Ohio, think about the Cuyahoga River being on fire in, in the 1970s, right? Um, so what kind of things, you have a great section where you say, here's 10 things you should do if you live in a fire area to protect your home. If you're going to build that list with us tonight about what 10 things we can do as citizens to protect our bigger environment from this changing landscape of fire, what what would the, what do you think about those being? Well, I know there there are some environmentalists who, in the last few years, especially, have said, you know, recycling, forget about it. It doesn't make much difference if you recycle or not. Uh, turning your thermostat down, taking shorter showers. I want to take that on first because I, I think collectively it, it it in fact does matter. Uh, if millions of people are doing that, it's it's clearly going to matter. But beyond that, I believe that's a way for many of us to just have the rest of the world life on this planet as a touchstone. And every time we do something simple to honor. Uh, our relationship and the inter interdependence we have, and that can include turning you know lights off and turning the heat down and recycling. Those are things that keep our energy um, alive and keep our efforts sustained. Because to be honest, the climate change issue is going to be with us for many, many, many decades. Uh, I, I, I hope we can work hard and, and moderate the worst of its effects. But this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. So I think those kinds of things keep us keep our hearts and our heads in the game uh, on, a, on a bigger scale. Um, yes, I think at the ballot box, it's 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 important to make sure that we are putting people in office who see the wisdom of putting enough resources for research and development into sustainable technologies. And one of the great advantages of that, and, and most of you know this, is that that sets us up for really embracing a, a, a very new economy 
So the next economy, many countries already realize, is, is going to be moving and planting its feet ultimately in sustainable technologies. And so to the extent that we can have people, politicians, who free up the money to allow those research and development projects that are so critical to making breakthroughs in any kind of technology, um, that's that's one thing we can do. Um, on the on the end of fire, one of the things we can do is to make sure that our our more local politicians, including county commissioners, are really are really keen. And we can talk about this much later, uh, a lot more later. But uh, on on making sure that subdivisions in the wilderness, urban or wildland, urban interface, so in those rural areas. Um, where increasingly fires are threatening people's structures and um, the safety uh, and risk factor for firefighters is going way up. If we can make sure that those developments are designed intelligently, that they, they have fire mitigation around them, that the housing uh, uh, is spaced at least 30 feet apart, that there's more than one way in and out of the subdivision, that there's water resources. If, the fire, if a fire breaks out and the fire department needs to get water resources, um, all of those kinds of things, and some places are going to be simply so fire prone for decades to come that they probably shouldn't have development in them at all. And those are really, really dangerous words to utter in the uh, independent minded uh, West. But, but this, is, this is where we are. And so I think in general, when it comes to environment and sustainability and a brighter future and hoping to get a handle on climate change, it's really taking what we know, and we really, really do know enough to know what to do. We don't have everything figured out with climate modeling and stuff that we've gotten awfully good. And so if we can align what we know from our good science, and we can act in ways that reflect the importance of interdependence, and we can have as our spokespeople, politicians and leaders uh, who are going to going to also honor that. That's a general answer, but I think that's where we have to go and, and, and how, we'll, how we'll move forward in a, in a positive way. Yeah, that's really interesting. We had a, um, just anecdotally, we had a, uh, what I thought was a creative proposal by a Montana legislator a few years ago, Hal Jacobson from Helena, who uh, proposed a um, wildlife, wildfire um, contingency tax that if you wanted to build a development or build a home within a wildfire adjacency, that you could certainly do so, but you were going to pay a tax because you were going to be most likely um, needing some services from firefighters in excess of those that might be required um, for regular city dwellers. It did not pass, but um, I thought it was an interesting yeah. approach short of you can't. Right, right. And, and to you can, and it will give us more resources and recognize some skin in the game. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Again, we're with Gary Ferguson, um, Land on Fire. Um, feel free, we got a great crowd tonight. You're not shy, so raise your hands or unmute yourself or use the chat feature. Sean, I know we've got a couple of questions already in the, uh, in the chat. So if you wanted to start with those, that'd be great. Yeah, Gary, and you just kind of touched on this, um, talking about the housing development, but Stacy wants to know what, about fires and places people should have never built, when do we decide not to allow that? And I think you just kind of answered it a little bit. It's it's a good question. And of course, politically, it's just dynamite to, 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 to make those decisions. So they're not gonna be easy, but um, to some extent they do have to be uh, met. And, and what one of the interesting things is now more than ever, thanks to new technology with satellite imagery, and uh, predictive modeling based on sa satellite imaging, we can sort of tell what are the places that are most likely to be really, really almost impossible to defend. We, we're getting a stronger and stronger sense of that. And even 10 years ago, we didn't, we didn't have that. Um, beyond that, uh, we can apply maintenance, I guess, if you, if you want to call it, uh, to uh, communities that perhaps shouldn't have been built where they are. And that includes thinning, more thinning immediately around a development than prescribed burn. But nonetheless, when we look at developments that have been treated in this way, if you will, the, the loss of structures is so much lower. I'll give you one quick example. In the Black Forest fire down in Colorado back in 2013, 
um, there was an area that in one particular subdivision, 61 out of 65 homes were destroyed right next door in the Cathedral Pine subdivision where they had done all of these uh, treatment things. They've removed vegetation from their homes. They've covered their vents with wire mesh. They've uh, you know, eliminated low hanging branches and the lower branches of trees so fires couldn't ladder up. Uh, th th there are a number of things, no, no vegetation uh, to speak of or significant standing vegetation within 30 feet of the house. They did all that and, and they lost uh, out of 67 homes, they lost uh, four. So again and again and again, we see that even in places that were sketchy in the first place to, to put in, they can, be, they can be made a little bit more fire safe uh, with some fairly simple tools. And happily, uh, as of January, the Forest Service uh, and some other agencies announced that part of the infrastructure uh, bill, there will be $3 billion, much of which is going to go toward helping that kind of preparation and those kinds of, uh, of treatments uh, in, in communities around the West. All right, I got a couple questions from our friend John. Um, the first one is, you talked about the fire whirl in the book. Can you describe that phenomenon a little bit for us? Yeah, there's a fire whirl and a more severe uh, phenomenon called fire tornado. Uh, they're, they're, they have somewhat similar uh, physics, if you will, but different scales. A fire whirl would be where there is such intense heat. And this is what happens when we get into the climate change end of things and the fuel moisture levels are so low. You know, routinely, uh, I'm in, in many summers now, you can walk into a forest and the fuel moisture load, which is something they measure continually through the year, will drop to about 10%. And, it, and, and to give you an idea, lumber at your um, lumber mill is about 11 to 12% fuel moisture. So that's how dry things are. We've also got increased wind happening for a variety of reasons, including from the size of the fires themselves, but also storm-related wind is up about 10 or 12% around the world, around the planet. So when you get that kind of intense heat uh, from a mega fire, which is defined as being 100,000 acres or more, it will create updrafts so powerful that under the right or wrong, if you will, conditions, there'll be vortexes formed at the base of those updrafts. And those they look like dust devils, basically, only they're, they're much bigger and they consist of, of, of flames. And as you get to the bigger size uh, fire whirls into toward fire tornadoes, they're strong enough. The updraft is so strong they can actually lift trees out of the ground, burning trees out of the ground and toss them, you know, however many yards. Uh, th th this is the kind of incredible uh, updraft that that, that that kind of heat is, is providing. So that's what a fire whirl is. One of the key reasons it's so important uh, has to do with firefighters. If, if a hotshot crew is in there digging a fire line, trying to get ahead of a, a, a flank of the fire, and they see fire whirls, one of the things that they're very nervous about all of a sudden is one, the erratic behavior of a fire whirl. You know, like a dust devil, you can't really make sense of where it's going to go next. Um, is it going to come at them? But just as importantly, is it going to pick up burning trees and embers and deposit those behind where the firefighters are digging their fire line, thereby sandwiching them between two burns, which is extraordinarily dangerous and, and, and even fatal? I, I think it's worth noting that only 5% of the firefighters in the United States are wildland firefighters. And yet they have a death rate about six times what urban firefighters have. Uh, and, and, and this is only gonna get more, more true, I think, as time goes on with the development of conditions that, that create things like fire whirls and fire tornadoes. All right, and Patrick has a question. He says there's a fissure forming in forest management between the timber industry's vision for managing the forest and a newer vision coming from the research in forest connectivity. Do you have an opinion on that difference? Um, I, I, I don't want to dismiss the concerns of forest industry. We use wood, okay? We, we, we need harvest. 
Uh, I'm very heartened by the fact that there has been the technology and the actual milling uh, devices developed over the last 15 years or so, so that smaller uh, dimensional timber can be taken and made into laminate beams. And there are actually entire buildings I know out in Portland and some other places on the West Coast made from those. So we don't necessarily need those big trees. The, th the, the place I get very nervous is when the timber industry starts suggesting that we really need to just, we, we need to thin like crazy and thinning is, is the only answer. Well, th that does potentially open a product for them. The thinning has potential consequences of its own, including what kind of forests are going to grow back. What are you doing to, uh, when you remove the tree canopy through thinning and open that canopy to sunlight, which dries the ground out more, thin the trees so that the wind has more uh, desiccating effect on the ground and potentially drying out the fuels that could be fire related. I don't think anybody has a full handle on this, but as always, to the extent we can let the best science we have, and we've got some pretty good science right now, drive that decision and choose areas to be thinned where it makes sense and where it feeds that commercial, reasonable commercial need, but not to go on some kind of wholesale uh, project of thinning and clear cutting because we're so freaked out that fires are going to happen because we're going to get the exact um, opposite effect ultimately. You know, when you when you have a clear cut, you, you tend to have a monoculture rise in its place. And that monoculture, when it gets to be about, depending on the tree, and I'm speaking of conifers, when it gets to be 30, 40, 50 years old, it becomes those, those single age stands become very appealing to things like pine bark beetles. So you can have a massive former clear cut suddenly taken over by pine bark beetles. Those trees die, they topple over in five, six, seven years, depending on the winds. And then what kind of fuel load have you got for the fires? So, you know, we, we do need to take the long-term uh, uh, road when it comes to making, making these decisions. And a scientific advisory board for those kinds of decisions, it, that's the way I think we, we should proceed uh, on that issue and many others. So we're going to do a little drawing tonight. Grace, I think you have some show and tell, perhaps. I have one. I, we're going to give away two things tonight. We're going to give away next, um, uh, next, or I guess not next month, but the next book, Song of Trees, uh, which is an Great. amazing, um, amazing book. And I'm sure that um, Tally, you can get this for people at the Midtown Reader, I'm sure. Um, and uh, also a Sperry mug. We thought that, um, as many of you know, and you're very supportive, um, wildfire was super real here in Glacier in 20, uh, 2017, 2018, and no more so than the loss of Sperry Chalet and, and kind of the remarkable uh, return from the ashes. So we'll be picking those winners here in just the next few minutes. And um, Gary was also very gracious to offer to sign book plates to anyone who would like to have a book plate. So if you would like to have a book plate to, uh, to put in your book, um, just uh, email grace at uh, glacier.org, grace at glacier.org, and she will uh, make sure to make that so. So thank you, uh, Gary, for your generosity. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, appreciate it. Sean, back to you. All right, Doug just mentioned the 2017 fires near Lake McDonald. Uh, Janet had a question. She said that those fires wiped out a lot of the trees around Lake McDonald and Pole Bridge, and the new growth has been heavy, and there's no spacing between those trees. How are areas like that managed by the forest or to create a healthy forest? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. Um, back in 1988, <clears throat> when Yellowstone burned, the following year, the lodgepole pines, which are among other trees, including uh, sequoias and, and several others, they, they're very cool to me because they have what are called serotonous cones. And on about 20% of the, uh, of the a cone crop is serotonous. So what that means is only in the presence of fire going up the tree and being in contact with that cone for about 15 or 20 seconds, which is what it takes for a tree to, a, a lodgepole anyway, to crown out the, the fire to go up consume the, the tree and then die down. The, the cones open up, the seeds drop, and uh, it's off to the races. And, and the lodgepole is, is the first to show up. And one of the reasons it wants to do that and develop that strategy is because that 
ash is so rich in nutrients. Uh, the things that were locked up in the trees before are, are, are available through that ash. And so you can grow trees like crazy after a fire. Um, and so the following year, there were uh, lodgepoles to the tune in some places in Yellowstone of about 300,000 trees per acre, which is nuts. I mean, you, you just could, couldn't really even walk through them. What happens over time, although it does take time and we humans don't have that much time on earth, so we get a little impatient, is some of those trees will do better than others and those that don't do as well will die out. And as the tree, as the forest matures, it will, if you will, self thin essentially by virtue of, of what trees have managed to make it um, and, and, and get, the, get the advantage over their competitors as far as uh, amount of sunlight they get primarily. So there will be a self thinning, even though right now it looks like a, 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 a bit of a crowded mess. Um, that that's just the way it starts. And then those who are hardiest and healthiest will survive. And the ones that, that aren't so robust will, will die off. All right. And how do you have a sense on how well Glacier Park or the Park Service is doing it safeguarding the structures inside the park, the hotels or ranger stations? You know, I don't, and I, I suspect that, I'll, I, I know more about Yellowstone. I suspect many of the people who are with us tonight could answer this more intelligently than me. It's been my experience from what I've heard in the Northern Rockies, um, the Park Service is doing uh, a very good job of, of trying to anticipate what the needs might be using the best technology that show starting at the beginning of the fire season where they might have trouble and then try to stage resources that are available to protect those structures um, when, when the time comes. That, that brings an interesting question though, outside the park, when we talk about structures in general and let's say they're, they're homes or second homes, the, the more deeply those structures get into that wildland urban interface. So if you're off in the far flung woods, the, the firefighters that are fighting forest fires, like for the state of Montana or state of California or US Forest Service Bureau of Indian Affairs, their uh, BLM, lots of agencies fight those fires. They are fighting fires with lightweight equipment, lightweight clothing, fairly lightweight packs. They have very limited access to any kind of significant uh, protection gear to fight structure fires. And I know I'm kind of segueing here, but th those aren't the people who are charged with or able to fight structure fires. That has always been the province of either county or city fire departments. That's why if a, a region of Montana starts to have all kinds of terrible fires, they'll get uh, fire engines donated, if you will, or loaned from all over, sometimes all over the country, coming to lend those engines and those pumps to structure protection. But I, I just mentioned it because sometimes we think, well, how come the Forest Service isn't better able to protect these, these um, neighborhoods that are out in, in the far flung reaches of the wildland urban interface? It's because they don't have the equipment and they don't have the training, but mostly they don't have the equipment and that's not what they're charged with doing. So um, I, just, I just wanted to mention that because that's not something that I fully appreciated even a few years ago. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, I'll just um, kind of maybe add one small thing and then maybe segue back, Gary, to have you address what I thought was a really interesting topic in your book that is on point to this, which is um, I heard a lot of things after Sperry that, you know, the Park Service should have wrapped the building, blah, blah, blah. What well, was wrapped, that's not all the wood was, was wrapped. They do do that um, in terms of protecting that infrastructure. And there's a lot of invested dollars in that infrastructure, um, uh, which is important. But you do address in your book, this idea of the transfer of power in a fire, um, you know, even from one level, a level one commander to a level two commander. But I watched that happen in the park. And at some point, the superintendent, as far as the fire is concerned, ceases to be the superintendent. He has handed that off to a fire commander. 
Um, and you do talk about that in, in your book a little bit that, um, you know, it becomes a different person's call with a different set of um, rules and regulations. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Greg, because it's one of the most sophisticated, impressive feats of social engineering I've ever seen. And it started uh, as um, sort of a recipe taken from the U.S. Navy for preparedness back in the 50s when California suffered some really horrific fires, uh, lots of loss of structures and loss of life. And so they wanted to come up with some sort of incident command system. And one of the reasons why they uh, decided in the 50s that they had lost so much is because there, everybody wasn't speaking the same language. The state had one set of fire conditions and understandings about what should happen when, and the feds had others. And, and so this not only unified the kind of communication that was going on, but it set up a very, very specific set of circumstances under which those circumstances suggest the kind of management team that you're going to get in. So if you've got a, a fire that's pretty mellow and it's maybe five or six acres, you might have somebody who's qualified to be an incident three or four commander. And the higher the, the number, the lower the intensity of the fire uh, come in. But at some point, if that changes, there's automatically, uh, when, when the boxes get ticked, to mark those changes, then a level three or a level two incident commander comes in and a whole other array of, uh, of air, air power, of uh, smoke jumpers, of, of hotshot crews, of, of uh, incident meteorologists. As the situation gets more and more intense, there's a team that shows up and really does, as you suggest, take control of things. And it's not the superintendent making that, making that decision because as, as well, it shouldn't be because there's no way any superintendent has the collective wisdom of that, of that team of, uh, of leaders that are so well-versed in fire behavior. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point. And I, I had no idea. Um, you know, I think I pay attention, but apparently not well enough. Uh, but, um, you know, it, but it's complicated. I mean, this is a very, you know, you, you think about putting out a fire as like, so you get a hose and you put out the fire. This is complicated business, isn't it? Uh, it? It's so fluid and increasingly more and more complicated because the fires are, are getting bigger and, and bigger. Um, largely due to climate change since 1985, twice as many acres are burning in the American West as, as there, there were in, in, in 85. And there's some suggestion with new research that every degree of centigrade the planet warms, we're likely to see around the globe a 600% increase in fire, wildfire activity. So this is going to get bigger. And as it gets bigger, the dynamics get more and more complicated. Fires get to be so hot and big that they create their own weather systems. Um, lack of humidity. And as the temperature goes up, humidity goes down. So that's another thing we're going to lose. And as humidity goes down, fuel moisture goes down. It's more ignitable. Um, all of those things are, are, are getting together in in creating fire behavior that to be honest uh, a lot of firefighters have never have never seen before yeah. and it's it's um it's a very dangerous uh time to to be a firefighter and of course safety is always uh, foremost uh in in firefighting and a lot of times fires are so big and doing things so unpredictable that it's just simply a matter of pulling back and protecting every structure and of course evacuating protecting human life but then the fire is is left to do what the fire is going to do and increasingly we find ourselves in those kinds of situations yeah yeah well it's, it really is um amazing it's an amazing book land on fire with uh, gary ferguson who's with us tonight um hails from the midwest and our random uh, winter generator apparently was vibing that because uh mark uh from wisconsin you are the winner of the book uh, and, and Linda from Illinois, you are the winner of the mug. Um, so, uh, so we're sending things back to to uh, to your hometown region, there, Gary. Perfect, love it, love it. Yeah. A little love to the Midwest, yeah. You know, to your point of, of the complicated nature, and I, I, I actually read a, I wrote a review of your book um, that was published in the Big Fork Eagle a couple of weeks ago, um, and I talked about one of the things that I really 
shook my head about, uh, I was in a meeting with the superintendent in 2017, and he said that he had just arranged um, to contract with Rain for Rent to um, put their system in on the going to the Sun Highway. And I gently raised my hand and said, I'm sorry, but you're <laughs> gonna have to help me out with this. But um, as I understood it at the time, basically, if you think of wheel line, and they basically are just putting moisture in the air. They're, they're, they're trying to raise the humidity by keeping giant farm type sprinklers that were laid down the middle of the going to the sun highway running to just raise humidity in the air. That's just astonishing. I mean, and it makes perfect sense. It may seem like a complete fantasy when you first think about it, but actually, just raising the humidity, even a percentage point or two, changes fire behavior considerably because it changes the amount of moisture in the wood that's going to be the fuel for the fire. And so it, it does make sense. I, it's, it's, it's a hard thing for me to get my head around, but, the, but those kinds of small shifts in weather really can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Sean, I think we had at least another couple of questions there. Yeah. Kathy is wondering, is there anything we can do to slow the pro proliferation of cheat grass? Oh my gosh, what a wonderful question. Yeah, we've got about 100 million acres of cheat grass in the West right now. Cheat grass was originally from Eurasia. It's a invasive, uh, a competitor to native grasses. It's extremely good at coming in right after fires and putting down, I'd say roughly double the root mass that most native plants can manage in the same number of weeks. It has very little nutritional value for wildlife. So that's a bummer. And the other uh, bad news is that usually by the middle of July, it's dried out becoming a very thick mat that is like flash paper. It is incredibly easy to light. So one of the best things to do is to try to make sure rangelands that are in pretty good shape stay in good shape by wise grazing practices. Um, there are some areas where they're trying to reseed and regenerate native grasses uh, so that uh, the cheatgrass doesn't have quite the advantage, but it's a very time and, and, and a, uh, intensive and, and costly uh, procedure. But generally, I would say soil health uh, after eradicating whatever uh, cheatgrass can be eradicated is going to be critical to uh, those native grasses coming back and at least limiting the amount of territory cheatgrass can take up. The other interesting thing is native grasses tend to have much, much deeper rootstocks, and that means they tend to sequester lots more carbon than um, a lot of invasives, including uh, cheatgrass. So that's just even another reason. They have more nutrition, not just for wildlife, but for cattle. So I know here in Montana, we're having a lot of ranchers looking into um, putting in uh, and restoring native grasses because they're finding their, their cattle uh, fatten uh, better on those native grasses. And of course, the native grasses with their roots so deep, not only store carbon, but they also store moisture uh, in the soil, which in the face of coming droughts is, is another really important thing. Yeah, so many complicated and interconnected uh, things. I was curious, Gary, um, you talk um, a lot about uh, one of the key features or people in this in this book is John Trapp. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he, he kind of seemed to act a little bit as a guide in, in certain ways as you work through this. Um, tell us a little more about John and how you guys got um, hooked up. Um, I know also a firefighting trap in Helena, um, who I think is related to John. Um, you know, that must have been an interesting resource to be able to spend time with somebody whose job this is every day. Well, it, you know, I came to know John when he was just ending his career as a wolf biologist, because I had spent lots of time with the wolves and wrote, as you said, the uh, Yellowstone Wolves the first year, but then also with Doug Smith, who's still the head of the Wolf Project Decade of the Wolf. And so John and I came together in Red Lodge, uh, I'm sure over a beer or two, talking about wolves. And then I learned about his uh, intense devotion to uh, wildfire and even community firefighting. He's been on the Red Lodge Fire Department for a long time and is extremely well thought of. But uh, pursuant to his goals at, uh, for, for being a great 
wildland firefighter, he has worked his way up to becoming an Incident 3 uh, fire commander. He's uh, uh, really respected in the, in the wildfire behavior training world of, of firefighting. And so John was, because I knew him, uh, I trusted him. Uh, I, I, I really respect the way John thinks of things, uh, the humility he brings to the task. Uh, and it is a task that does call for some humility that John did serve as a, as a guide for me and point me in the directions that I, I needed to consider both as far as other resources and also how to think about fire in ways that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, super interesting. So those of you uh, familiar with our program, occasionally um, I, and I've pre-warned our author tonight, um, occasionally we have a speed round. Um, so given that you've just talked about adult beverages, my first question in the speed round is IPA or PBR? IPA. Okay. You didn't even good. have to finish the question. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, so this, this also might not be fair, but Stegner or uh, Abby? Oh, I, okay. I, I'll, I'll just throw out Stegner, but I, I want to qualify it a little bit. When I was in my late teens and 20s, Abby just got my juices flowing. Now, I have learned since he was, you know, a considerable misogynist and had some behavioral <laughs> qualities that I'm not particularly fond of, but his passion and his sort of in-your-face defense of, of, of wildlands was very inspiring to me at a certain time in my life. I also must say <clears throat> I've become a good friend of Doug Peacock, who was the role model for Hey Duke and the Monkey Wrench Gang, and we hang out together. And so for that reason, too, I, I still have a soft place in my heart for, for Abby Stegner. I do like for the depth of his philosophical um, uh, arguments and also his unsurety. You know, as a, as a man, he was he was just I think humble enough to always be willing to have his mind changed to some extent if uh, if conditions were were different than he imagined. And so, I think the older I get, the <clears throat> the more I'm trying to, to to embrace some some of that humility and that not knowing and and the wisdom of the not knowing. And I, I have one more, um, but before I do that, maybe if my friend Ed Wilson has it handy, Ed sent me a great book about Stegner and. Um, about Stegner and Abby. And if you remember oh. the title, because I don't have it with me, you put that in the chat. If you remember it, Ed, that'd be awesome. Yes, um, please. Okay, so the third one, also um, unfair, McGuane or Bass? Oh. I know, I'm killing you. God, you're you? killing me, man. You're killing me. Picking <laughs> writers, that's, uh, that's a dangerous business for me to do. I I became a friend of, of Rick's long ago, and I have such respect for the commitment and the compassion and passion he has for that yak country that he has year after year against all odds put all into odds. it. Um, I, I I will I will say Rick, I love McGuane's writing, but um, from what I know of Rick as a human being, I, I just I I couldn't think of anyone more uh, inspiring. So. Um... What are you doing now? What's next? Well, I am casting about for what my next book project is going to be. Uh, and I have not, after 27 books, actually, I've not had a lot of fallow time in my career. And so I you know, don't know why it came along right now, but I'm not fighting it. I'm trying to get out there as much as I can, listen to as many people as I can, be out in the natural world as much as I can and see what starts to rise. This is a very odd time in, in the culture, in, in publishing. Uh, and then also Mary and I are, are quite busy with full ecology. We're doing keynotes around the country, leaving next week for uh, some East Coast land trust uh, uh, keynotes. And then <clears throat> back to the Hudson River, just North of New York for uh, another keynote uh, later in the year. And and that that work really feels good to me. This 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 wedding of nature and humans as if they were ever separate in the first place. Uh, I think we need that for the journey ahead. And so um, I'm, I'm pretty excited to be working with Mary on that. Yeah, that's exciting. And we are just so thankful um, for your time tonight. I, I try and uh, be respectful of both your and our group's time. So we try and keep this uh, to an hour and we are at that, believe it or not, it's gone so quickly because it's been yeah. such an, an, an incredible and enriching uh, time. And, and thank you um, for, for being with us. Um, and as I said earlier, you are now, uh, Gary, part of the Glacier family. 
Um, so you now have friends uh, that you didn't know you had. Um, I love it. So, so we hope you have a big guest room, but um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, um, we, we do uh, here at Glacier, in Glacier Country. And so uh, again, Gary Ferguson, thank you for um, the work, the important work and the insights that it gives us uh, the things we can do to make a difference um, in, uh, in the Rocky Mountain West. And um, we look forward to seeing you soon and to uh, reading more from you in the very near future. Gary Ferguson, Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you. Really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And have a great night. We'll see you next time.